throw this out conference a will now be recorded. I'm just going to throw out a topic um, to sort of get us started, but whatever direction y'all want to go in is is perfect. Given that Florida has re experienced a resurgence in cases, um, has this affected practices you had originally put into place at your library? How are you currently feeling about opening your library to the public? Hi, this is Phyllis from uh, the Dunedin Public Library. How y'all doing? Good I just morning. wanted to let you know that. Hi, um, we are open. Um, we opened on uh, June 1st and we have modified hours. Um, we also have um, limited services and uh, it's, it's going pretty well. Uh, we're open from 10 to noon, one to three, and then four to six. We close twice a day for cleaning. Um, we do temperature checks at the front door and um, we have masks available if somebody needs it. I'd say about probably 90% are coming in with masks, um, but they do like the masks that are there. So we've kind of scaled back and say, if you need it, you can take one because they were taking them even <laughs> when they were wearing a mask. So, um, so we've kind of scaled back. Our computer usage is uh, 30 minutes and that's working out just fine. So. Um, we had one week about uh, 1,400 people come for the week. Uh, we're doing curbside pickup for those that don't want to come in. So we had, um, I think it was 62. And then um, our computer usage is like 180, um, 180 people that are using it. So it's, it's working out good. We're trying to keep the schedule. We have no volunteers. Um, the books, the friends bookstores closed. Um, we're really limiting who's in our building and we're seeing the majority of people are coming in, getting what they need, and then um, leaving. Um, so we are closed on the weekends. We close our book drops on the weekends. Um, so it's it's working out. We're having all of our materials returned outside at our curbside book drops. Uh, we quarantine them for 72 hours, um, kind of clean them off, and then um, put them back out. So everything seems to be working pretty well for us right now. That's great. Uh, so how's the midday uh, cleaning going? So we do, um, our staff does a wipe down um, of our materials, um, our high usage points um, and throughout the building. Um, so we, um, we were having a hard time finding the Clorox or Lysol wipes um, just because those are much easier. but. Our uh, facilities department has provided us with some cleaning solutions, um, so we've been doing that. We also have our contract cleaners come throughout, and they do all of the, the restroom and the high-touch um, areas. But our staff is doing um, their desks, everything, um, and the tables and chairs throughout the building. Um, we have vinyl on everything, so it, it's easy to wipe down um anyway um so it's working out and i think what's really good is that the staff has a little bit of time as like a breather we can mm -hmm. if you go in your office you can take your mask off you know just things like that that kind of break up the day um and our, i'll tell you our library looks beautiful it's so clean our books are so or our collections all organized and perfect so um, we're loving that so wonderful Good morning. This is Lois Enel from Eastlake Community Library, and I'm a neighbor of Phyllis's. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're both in Pinellas County. Um, ditto to pretty much everything that Phyllis has stated, but since we're all independent libraries, um, we run things a little differently. Um, we are also quarantining our books for ours are 48 hours for our, our materials. We are a very small building, the smallest in Pinellas. So we have instituted a badge system for patrons coming in. We have 20 badges and we ask them to simply put one on so we can keep a traffic count. And then as they leave, they're put in a separate basket that we wipe down with disinfectant. Um, we haven't had any problems. It's a steady stream, but um, 
not any mobs coming in with the lack of summer programs as far as in person summer programs. Uh, we do have electrostatic cleaning every Friday, and that is done by a cleaning service that takes care of all the surfaces and computers. And um, we do have wipes throughout the building, hand sanitizers. Our staff wipes everything down each time they come to the front desk and their workstations. Um, we do not take temperatures for the patrons, only for our staff. Um, we do have a closed stacks in the children's room. Our children's room is very small, and if we tried to have even a few families in, there would not be social distancing possible. So um, we have created a concierge service with our staff. They wait at the front door of the children's room and accommodate their requests and needs as best they can. We even will bring them out to the car if necessary. Um, all of the front stations have the acrylic screens and have the wipes. Um, we also have wipes available for all of the packs or the public computers. We do limit the public computers to 60 minutes. Um, I think the one thing I would like to see, I could not mandate masks for the patrons since it was not, you know, legally possible. However, our county commissioners are voting on this tomorrow. And if that's so, we have them available, but we can't mandate patrons to wear them. Our staff will wear them. So I'm hoping that if they pass that, then, then we can mandate that since it does make a difference in terms of, you know, preventing the spread of the disease. If even one of our staff comes down with testing positive, then we're forced to close the building. So I'm trying to protect not only my staff, but the patrons as well. And uh, as with Phyllis's library, we do not have any volunteers coming in because our building is just too small to even accommodate them. So um, summer programs are going as well as can be expected. Um, everybody's doing Facebook programs and virtual programs and uh, the people come in and get take and makes that they can take home and do. And the reading club is either online or they can come in and pick up a bag and do it that way. But you know, I think I think we're all doing fine under the circumstances. It's just that it's so fluid, it's so difficult to make any plans for the near or distant future in, in, in terms of what's going to happen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. Others? Since you brought up programming, I'd like to ask, um, you know, I'm sure that most people are just offering uh, virtual programming, but in the event that you are considering offering face-to-face, -face, what would that look like? Um, what have you learned about offering the online programs that would be helpful to others? What, what have been your, your um, biggest challenge or your greatest reward in offering these programs virtually? Hi, it's Christy from the Lighthouse Point Library. How are you doing? Hi, Christy. <laughs> um, we're actually offering all of our summer programs online through Read Squared. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I found interesting is uh, three of the programs, uh, if the kids participate, they get a craft pack package for the next week. And we get a really good response on those. The one that doesn't have like a craft hands-on package, uh, we've seen that uh, participation declining, so we're thinking about adding that to that fourth program. Um, I think the parents were just so happy to have something to do with the kids that they didn't have to plan everything themselves. And when I say craft package, I literally mean like a, a paper plate and torn up construction paper, <laughs> and it's not... <laughs> from Oriental Trading. It is a Ziploc bag with very inexpensive things we had here. So we were really surprised at how good the response was 
from our community, they just wanted something to to do with their kids that was easy and and um, you know they're they're definitely shorter our programs than they are in in the library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christy. And Claudia, we also have a, a few questions in the chat. Great. Um, well, and Christy, one of them's yours. Um, how many libraries are having volunteers come in and help out? And I asked that, I, I just hooked up my microphone, sorry. <laughs> um, I ask that because our volunteers are chewing at the bit to come in and we are not open to the public yet. Being in Broward County, none of the libraries are open yet. Um, and I wondered if anybody had volunteers coming in and if they were, if there were protocols. Most of my volunteers are in an age group that are most at risk. And so um, we have been looking at really holding off on bringing in volunteers to uh, help out like they normally do. And I wondered if anybody had, had brought in people. So Christy, this is Phyllis, and as I mentioned in my update, we um, we do not have volunteers in our, our building or our um, friends' uh, volunteers. And one of the main reasons why is our city, with our policy, um, we have lots of protocols just for staff coming back in the building. Um, we're trying to limit the number of people, um, the interaction, and um, so it was one of the things that was city initiated that it should just be city staff. So our staff areas are just staff. Um, if we have anybody, a vendor or someone coming to work, um, they have to have a temperature check, they have to wear a mask. Um, so we're, we're really limiting the access into our building, um, even though we are open to the public. Um, we are doing it just at that 50% capacity um, and keeping it very limited. But as you kind of mentioned, uh, most of our volunteers, again, are in that same at-risk um, area. Um, so we want to just keep our building as, you know, keep things as simple as possible and, as, and keep the numbers down. Hi, this is Lois again from Eastlake. We have only one volunteer coming in one adult volunteer um she runs our friends bookstore and because we are taking donations she comes in almost daily to go through the donations to sort them to put them out um after quarantining them onto the public floor so that they can be sold in our bookstore since it's one of the few ways that we have of earning any income for the library um i think the the other concern i have and and they are all you know mostly in that age group that we're concerned about. But the other side of the coin is we're getting constant phone calls from students looking to earn their bright futures scholarship hours. And I think that's a mm. big concern. I don't know, Claudia, if you know of anything in terms of the Department of Education, if they're making any kind of um, adjustments because of this, that these students are unable to go to the typical, you know, places like libraries to earn their scholarship hours. I don't know. I can certainly find that out though and share that with you all. Yes, that would be appreciated. Lois, well, can, I, can I jump on that one real quick? We had the same exact thing mm -hmm. and uh, we actually have the teens doing online book talks of, um, Sunshine State readers on our website, and um, according to the teens, they can count those hours, that time, setting all of that up and reviewing the books as volunteer time. Wow, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I like it, that. <laughs> yeah, it, that's. I did not research it myself. I'm being completely honest. Um, one of the one of our teens came up with the idea, went and did the research, and we're like, sure. <laughs> So if you go to our website and you go to youth um, summer reading, there is literally a link there for all of the teen book talks and they can load them on there. 
and they've been adorable. <laughs> oh, I love it. I will check it out. Thank you. Amy also posed the question, how have your staff responded to the openings? What have their concerns been? I think one of the biggest concerns that they had was, you know, the the patrons that come in that do not practice, you know, the wearing the masks or social distancing. I, I've tried to empower them and said, if you are not comfortable interacting with the patron for any reason, you may certainly excuse yourself from the situation. Um, or you can call for a, a supervisor if it, you know, it's evident that the person might be ill or such. Um, you know, I, we've done everything we can to protect people, you know, and 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 give them the, the, like I said, empower them to be able to walk away from a situation in terms of not feeling comfortable, you know, but there are all of the preventive measures in place that we could possibly enforce. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer shared a reference from IMLS um, about uh, what is a, a, um, research showing virus undetectable on five highly circulated library materials after three days. Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. So I, I noticed too that there is a, a little bit of concern about you know, of course, you know, when people can come into the library with their children, um, usually you see lots of, of um, activity in the summer, of course, and you, you sort of get ready for that. But now it's a little bit different. So how are you handling kind of getting the word out? What has worked best for you in getting the word out and sort of, um, you know, hoping that there's some, uh, uh, sharing uh, among community members about the activities that the library is providing virtually. So this is Phyllis. Our, um, our librarians that are doing programming, we have um, advertised on all of our social media outlets for the city. Um, the city did a really good job of promoting our summer programs um, that are online. Um, and I think too, they're also, um, when we do our curbside pickup um, and uh, if they pick up their reading bag over in the youth or the adult section, there's information um, putting them to the online um, programming um, we are using a service called Page Turners for our youth programming, and it's working out really, really well. Um, and we have it on our main page, so we've been keeping stats on the usage of that. Um, our adult programming I, is not as heavily used online, but we're doing a nice um, author one that I think will be good. We were trying our tech classes online, um, and we, we're not getting a huge number on that. Um, and I think, too, with the kids and teens, I think they were just so busy and inundated with online learning with school that they are all kind of taking like a little breather. But I, I do know with our page turners, um, staff has said that uh, patrons have come in and they're, they're checking it out every day, the youth page, and they've loved all the programming. Um, so I think that's really fun. Um, so we're excited about that. But I would say our social media outlets, um, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, our Twitter uh, for the city has really promoted our stuff. Excellent.
Are there other partnerships with your in your community that have developed as a result of things changing so much? Okay, so since we've talked a little bit about page turner and um, read squared, what uh, what other new tools have you discovered that have been particularly useful to you in, in any any area of the library? Uh, were there any that you didn't like and why didn't you like them? But mainly let's let's talk about those tools that have been particularly helpful and why they've been helpful. Okay, um, we'll go on with the next question, but Ezra, if, if you think about a tool that you really liked and you want to share more about that, feel free to do that in chat or bring it back up later on. Um, I have a question about the statistics that you're collecting this year. Um, what are y'all collecting uh, that reflects the shift from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to virtual services? And are there any new services that you're offering remotely? So Claudia, I think this will be a good question for the Bureau just to see what our state report <laughs> will look like in uh, when we do that in November. Um, just because, as you mentioned, our stats are very different, you know, like our online usage of materials, um, just our databases, everything. I mean, April was just skyrocketing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of like adjusted, you know, how many checkouts could be online or, you know, we were all just pushing our online resources. So now coming back where we're open a little and looking at our budgets, I think, you know, we're all trying to find that happy medium between the print and the online um, services yeah. that we're given. So obviously the new service that many of us added was that curbside pickup. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been keeping stats at our library on that. Um, but I think it's the online resources that we're just seeing such a huge intake the other thing is um, your computer usage. Um, we do have where people can access our Wi-Fi right on the outside of our building, um, but you know I think that's something to look at at expanding. I think we all kind of realized during that time uh, it was it was hard for a lot of people who rely on our computers to use it. Um, if they did have, you know, most of the time people. Um, you know, the first thing to go is your, you know, cable and internet access, those kinds of things. So I think expanding our broadband, what we can do to serve people on the outside. I think too, um, uh, we didn't, but I know a lot of other libraries looked at uh, laptops for checkout. So I think it's just kind of that shift to realize, you know, um, we've never experienced a, a pandemic like this. You know, what if there's something, again, what do we need to, to look at as our services as they change um, to help? Because uh, I found that a lot of it, uh, using it remotely, um, just our online cards picked up. There, there's a lot of stats that I think we're going to have to look at differently when we're mm -hmm. doing our state report. That's true. And this is a conversation that uh, we have certainly had in the Bureau and are having with our uh, colleagues throughout the nation on uh, questions that are going to be added to the statistical report. 
um, or as a supplement uh, in Florida as a supplemental uh, survey. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that. Uh, it'll be front and center um, when we get ready to, to post them. Um, and we all know that people <laughs> suffer from survey fatigue, uh, but I think it's really gonna be critical that we are diligent in reporting how we um, are measuring the activities that we're doing and the services that we're providing, uh, not only you know, of course, for the national, our reporting to the IMLS, but more importantly, or as equally importantly, to um, to our local government, to our boards of commissioners, you know, these, these entities that are so important to our lifeblood. Um, so uh, I did want to actually, um, maybe Dolly or Casey would like to talk a little bit about, um, who are my colleagues, who would like to talk about uh, the statistics and summer reading. I know that you've probably been inundated with this, but Casey, or would you like to just mention that? Sure, um, and I can I see that Dolly also put a, a note in the comments saying the National Statistics Working Group has been working on this very question and has come up with some extra questions that they're going to ask uh, next year or ask this year for summer reading. Um, and I'm happy here in a minute. I can go pull the cheat sheet that I made, um, but we sort of reworked. Uh, we reworked this, the stats because we realized that a lot of uh, summer reading programs have gone online and virtual and we wanted to make sure that we were capturing all of that hard work. And so what we have essentially done was we have split the statistics into active programming and self-directed programming. And so the active programming is anything that is live and happening right then and there. Um, and and again this this is really for the summer reading program um but essentially you know live story times on facebook that counts as an active program because it's happening then and there uh, we know that some people are doing live escape rooms digitally um, and then self-directed is you know programming that patrons can do on their own time and kind of work through it at their own pace and so that's sort of how we've split it apart so that we can still capture that information and that number those numbers um, dolly also said the extra questions will go beyond summer reading and will include all your stats so that's just a little snapshot yeah so some of the other uh, issues that are going to be covered or are things like um, hot spots or uh, are you extending your um, wireless to outside the library and on the you know on the grounds of the library um, I'm curious are people um, marking areas in their lo parking lot uh, to sort of help people know what the boundaries are or anything like that uh, I don't know if that's been helpful to your community or if you've had a chance to do that or even wanted to do that. Ours is just, um, I think the people figure it out that they can be out in our uh, garden area or right out front of our building. We haven't done a lot of um, advertising of that just because we do not want congregation to happen mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. a lot of room there. Um, so we definitely uh, were doing that and ours does not go out into our parking lot um, we uh, Duke Energy has out there and I can't get the Wi-Fi to get out there so um, we have it just on the outside of our building that people can do thank you Anyone else?
I'd be curious to, to know what other um, statistics you all are collecting uh, that reflect what you're doing. Are these conversations that you all are having in your libraries? Dolly also tacked on in the chat, what, statistic, what statistics would you like to share with the division and IMLS? I don't know how you can um, quantify it, but I do a lot of libraries different services within their cities or county while they were working. Um, like we at Dunedin, we were phone calls to all our business. Um, but I'm not sure had their seats, their library throughout providing services. So I, I don't know how we can quantify programs. I'm sorry, uh, Phyllis, you were cutting out a little bit. Could you repeat what you were saying? Okay. Yes, there might be someone who needs to. Hello? Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I was saying is that uh, during the quarantine period when libraries were closed, a lot of counties and cities had their library employees working in other um, realms throughout their city or county. I know at Dunedin we were doing phone calls to all the businesses um, and restaurants, um, things like that. So, um, and I know some were working in, so I don't know how you can come up with a line to reflect, you know, the other duties that library staff were doing during closure time. There actually will be a question about that, I believe, um, you know, sort of a, a qualitative question. Please share the other activities that, that either you were reassigned to do or that you volunteered to do a, as a, a library uh, to serve your communities. So I think, yeah, it will be collected, but we would love to have that information. Um, Amy, could you share a little bit more about um, the COVID events that your staff were involved in? Sure, sure. can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Hi. Hey. So yeah, um, one of the things that our city has been really good about is we do a food distribution. We've essentially done it twice a week since this essentially started. And so the library staff has been involved in that quite a bit. And also with mass distributions for the city residents and also COVID testing. We've had quite a few um, COVID pop-up testing centers. And so in addition to actually kind of farming staff out to other departments to assist um, with them kind of reopening and, and preparing. Um, we've been doing those COVID related items. Um, our library remains closed at this time. The city manager is very hesitant about opening, um, uh, especially in Palm Beach County, given the, the major spikes we've had in just the last week or so. Um, so we are kind of relying on the county system and viewing how they are responding to it. Um, but in the meantime, the it is very much important for us to keep our staff active, and so they have been helping out quite a bit at these events. Great. So is that so? That's voluntary, or is that something that that uh, you know your your library is sort of compelled to do, or? Well, it's, I mean, it, it varies. So um, all staff in the city are still receiving payment. They're still mm -hmm. getting paid. And so um, it's essentially, if you are called to work, you are expected to perform this unless you have a circumstance that would prevent you from doing so if you have a pre-existing condition or even if you feel uncomfortable, it's not a situation where they have to work. Um, mm -hmm. Several staff have come forward to me and said, look, I want to do this. Please 
you know, help me, you know, I want to be active. And so that's kind of different. So staff essentially have, when they're called in to do these items, they have the option to report or they can utilize their paid leave if they don't want to report for this item due to their concerns. And of course, we've also um, kept in line with the FFCRA, um, you know, if, if an employee is qualified for that, they have that option too, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How are others handling, um, you know, comfort levels. If you if you feel uncomfortable participating in a task or um, or or not, <laughs> you know, it could be it could be both ways, I guess. Um, how do, how how do you handle that, both as a staff member or as a manager? Um, hi, it's Lois again. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if anyone feels uncomfortable at the front desk, okay, we will relieve them or take over for a particular patron or for a time period. Um, we have also allowed uh, a number of our staff, because we are in a small building, to work from home several days a week um, to fulfill, you know, their responsibilities, and many of them are able to do their social media and uh, marketing and publicity from home, so um, that eases the any overcrowding conditions that we may have in staff areas. Um, we have separated all of the staff into other areas, such as study rooms and such, so that they're not in close quarters in the library itself when they're, when they're working here. Um, and again, with the volunteers not coming in, um, that also has alleviated any type of overcrowding. But um, my, my staff knows my door is always open, that they can come in, and if there's any concerns that they have, especially if they have you know, family members with, you know, compromised immune systems or whatever. Um, we work through each thing individually on a on a case by case basis, but they, I'm not mandating anybody be put into a situation that they feel uncomfortable with. Um, this is Amy again. Uh, like I said, our city has actually been really good about ensuring that our staff, the entire city staff, has been compensated for this whole time period. So, and they are very cognizant of, you know, mental health concerns with employees about um, wanting to feel safe in their work environments. So, um, the, the staff are never required in any situation to report. We know that that's not a circumstance. And as a supervisor, I also, you know, just looking at the events where we're asked to schedule people, having knowledge of, of our employees' concerns, know, you know, who are more reasonable, you know, not reasonable, excuse me, but more comfortable, I should say, in dealing with certain situations and others who are not. Um, so the staff, um, I think that they felt very comfortable in the circumstances they've been working in, especially since the city is taking great strides and trying to ensure that you know social distancing is always there PPE is always a requirement so um, I have to say it's been pretty good so far but as we transition into other phases it's going to be interesting to see you know if that stays the same or, or if there's potential for change so yeah That sort of leads into another question I had, which was, how do you envision your library functioning in the next six months? How do you think your role might be different in the library? Kind of hard to say, six months, I mean. <laughs> Hi, it's, it's Christy again. Um, I am not sure when we would be able to offer in-person programs again because we have such a small room that in order to social distance maybe 
six people could be in that room. Um, and I get that question a lot by phone from patrons. They want to know when their knitting class is going to start back up or when, <laughs> when we're, we're going to have, um, you know, in-person kids story times. And that's the biggest question we have is how are we going to function with, um, programming in such small programming spaces where we were already kind of outgrew that space and now with adding six feet between people it's just pretty much impossible I know it's pretty hard to, to kind of think about six months down the road, but um, so you think that virtual programming is is more here to stay than than uh, probably before. Um, and how what what other services do you envision continuing? Um, do you think that curbside will continue? Or do you want it? I mean, you know, it could be that this is an uh, this has been an opportunity that you found a new service that you hadn't thought of or just hadn't offered, and now you are um, that you think is working really great. Um, so this is Phyllis. Um, sorry to be such a big talker today. That's but... great. Um, I, I think there's just so much uncertainty right now. Uh, just when I think we have a plan or we were thinking, oh, we'll start programming back up in, you know, whatever we had decided. Um, it just, it keeps changing. So um, I, I, you know, I just keep telling my staff, you know, we're back. We're not back to normal. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we're trying out the different virtual outlets and seeing how that's working. Um, as I mentioned, some are, are working fine. The uh, online book club is, is a fun one to do. Um, I know our people miss um, programs, um, but I, I think safety and um, is, is priority right now. Um, so I'm not rushing back with our in-house programming. I'd love to say that people could follow the rules and, you know, socially distance correctly. I mean, we set up tables in our meeting room just to kind of see how things would work. Um, cleaning it, all that kind of stuff has just added another component um, to staff's daily stuff. Uh, I would love to say we could have it, but I, I'm not looking for it until the, you know, fall at least at this point. Um, so I, I do think um, I do. Uh, I our curbside pickup was huge. Um, we had started that before we actually opened to the public on a limited basis. Um, I like the service. I have a couple staff members. I think they would just love to do. Curbside. So it definitely has me thinking you know, if we do a renovation or a new build um, a drive through would be a, a key thing to have at a new library or renovated library. Thank you. Are there others who are seeing um, new services that they are going to continue? Karen, I don't know, are you trying to talk? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I 
I'm assuming that budgets are going to be pretty tight this coming year. Uh, how do you envision um, using the budget that you will be getting to provide services? Going back to curbside, Gretchen did say curbside pickup is something that is popular for people for various reasons, particularly seniors, and will most definitely continue this into the future. Great. I understand uh, several people have mentioned that adult programming is a little bit more difficult to do um, given the fact that uh, the libraries are for the most part not open for uh, live programming. How do you think that you will reach um, adults uh, through other mechanisms? What, what do you think, what are you thinking about in terms of programming for that particular um, group. Hi, Karen from Delray. We uh, did some adult programming last week using Zoom with an e email uh, invitation and an evite, and we had 22 show up. So it was right. a and then a Q&A after that, and we moderated it. So we think we may be on to something. And that um, population is usually sort of 55 and above. So we're hoping that continues. And what was the program again? It was, oh, it was an uplifting subject about uh, former pandemics. <laughs> oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Hi, this is Amy. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so in our area, we, we have quite an extensive digital divide. And I was wondering if any of the other libraries on site, if as a result of this pandemic, have any of your managements moved towards or started considering um, like citywide Wi-Fi or something of that nature where there was kind of a city-based free Wi-Fi system for the patrons? I was wondering if that was something anybody else had talked about. I, Karen, again, we still dream of getting our uh, bookmobile, though I think it should be a golf cart in uh, Delray and, uh, you know, driving out to those neighborhoods that are less fortunate with hotspots and uh, lending them right out of the, uh, the golf cart is what I'd like to do. But we haven't had much support for that. And I'm concerned about putting some money into that now when I really don't know what's going to happen with our budget next year. And I'd hate to have to sort of cut that service off. Once you offer a service, you want to continue it. So we're we're just going to bide our time and see what we can do maybe next fiscal year. We'll see. So that's my question about um, hotspots is since you have to sign some sort of licensing agreement to offer those, how how do you how do those libraries who are offering them uh, do you just view them as sort of disposable after a couple of years or do you re re up the uh, license agreement or you know how what is your vision Uh, we haven't done it yet, but we looked into it through um, 
T-Mobile, and it's a monthly cost that would roll in the hardware. So I'm not sure how, how long a contract we'd have to sign. We're still playing with that idea. But I think um, places like Broward and Miami are well ahead of us on this, so I'd probably go and talk to them. Jennifer, are you still on the line? Could you address that if any of your members have um, are offering hotspots? I don't know that she's still on the call. I see that Cheryl is though. Cheryl, do, are you familiar with whether um, members in your um, co-op are, are um, in, in offering hotspots? In your system, I believe it is. So this is Phyllis, if Cheryl's, she might not be available. Um, we do in Pinellas County, uh, Dunedin does check out hotspots. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're all pretty different, um, but I think there's uh, probably about five or six of us in the county that do um, offer hotspot checkout. Um, at Dunedin, um, we have 10 of them and our library foundation pays for the um, fees. It's a monthly fee. Um, that we have for unlimited data for our hotspots. So um, it is definitely something, oh good, she said four, uh, four of us that offer it in Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Lois is one too, um, and Safety Harbor and Clearwater was looking at one also. So um, we do offer it. Um, I would say, you know, it's a great, great service. Um, it, it is a little costly depending on, on what you're looking at um but um we offer it we love it um and we will continue to do it we'd love to get more but as i mentioned it's i you know uh it's about 300 dollars a month mm. for us for the 10 for the 10 that you offer yes for unlimited uh-huh and yeah. how do you how do you handle it maybe i'm getting in the weeds here a little bit the uh privacy issue or the uh, internet protection and that kind of thing? So um, you can have filters on it, which we do. Uh -huh. So they, they have filters, you can set that up. Um, the other thing too is if it's not returned, uh, when it's due, we can shut off the service. Um, we've had to do that and it's returned probably within an hour <laughs> once it's not. <laughs> um, we have had two hotspots that were completely lost. Um, we had turned them off. They've never been returned. Um, so, and that was kind of our things with during this, um, during our closure, you know, we were kind of looking at how, how much stuff would be, um, how much stuff would be losing um, with stuff not getting returned. So um, the, we have T-Mobile and they've replaced our, um, Hot spots and we continued with our service so it, it's worked out really well great and I see that Robert says Pasco is uh, is also circulating uh, hot spots to patrons so great yeah we have I think 50 ish of them Wow. and I want to say the holds list is probably usually hovers around 100 people mm -hmm. excellent Hi, Claudia. This is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. I apologize for that glitch. I did. Oh. I answered your message in chat. I don't know if you could see it. Um, we did. But for some reason, yeah, my phone just got disconnected, and so I couldn't respond right away. Sorry That's about okay. that. No problem at all. Well, I see that we're right almost at the top of the hour. Um, I really appreciate everyone participating. Uh, coming in, listening, whatever it is that you feel most comfortable doing. 
Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, the recording is going to be available on BLD's YouTube channel, so check it out if you missed something, had to step away or whatever. Uh, we hope to see you again, and I, I would like to say see you because we'd love to see you on uh, if you have a webcam, and if you don't, we want to hear you or just read what you're interested in sharing uh, in the chat. Uh, we hope to see you again on uh, July the 6th at 10 o'clock Eastern for our next session. Until then, everybody, please be safe, be healthy, and enjoy life. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.